The performance of our filters is tightly coupled with the motion and measurement models that we use. In order to get the best performance out of our filters, our models need to be tailored to our specific filtering problem. In this section, we will look at some of the more important and commonly used motion models that can be used in a variety of settings. We will also learn some principles and techniques that you can use to develop your own motion models when none of these standard models are sufficient. Although the emphasis in this section is on motion models, we will also discuss measurement model design. Compared to motion models, measurement models are typically more tailored to the specific properties of the sensor that is used. At the end of this section, we will look at some measurement model examples to get some insights in how one can design these. Roughly speaking, the motion models that we will look at can be categorized into two groups. The first group contains models that describe translational kinematics. Here, the object is essentially viewed as a point object that moves around in space. So they can be translated, here we model this using a 2D velocity vector that describes the direction of travel, but they are not rotated. So we have seen examples of this already, namely the Rano walk, but we will also look at the constant velocity and the constant acceleration models. Now, these models are often fairly simple and general, which has the advantage of making our filters less complex. On the other hand, they are limited in the type of motion that they are able to express. So in many cases, we could probably do better. The second group contains models that describe rotational kinematics. This can be just pure rotations in 2D or 3D, but they can also be a combination of rotations and translations. Sometimes these orientations can be connected to the translation of the object, but this is not a requirement. Here is a typical example where we use this type of model, and that is to describe the motion of a car. Now, as a car is moving on the road, it's typically sufficient to model its motion in 2D, that is, on the road surface. So let's assume that this 2D coordinate system here represents the road surface. Now, to describe the motion of the vehicle on this road plane, it seems reasonable to describe the orientation of the vehicle using this angle phi, and the speed in which the car is traveling in this direction, denoted as v. To model how the vehicle turns, it's also common to introduce the vehicle jaw rate, omega, which is a time derivative of phi. As a car, typically do not tend to drift too much sideways, which we would allow for with this kind of model. With this rotational model, we have the possibility to describe more car-like movements, which can help our filter to make better predictions and remove some more noise in our observations. Now the drawback with this type of model is that it's typically more complex which adds complexity to our filters. Here are two important aspects that we'll touch upon in this section concerning motion modeling and more specifically discretization of motion models. Now there is an underlying assumption here that I think I should clarify. Typically, for example, the motion of the objects that we're interested in take place in continuous time, so normal time for you and me. However, our filters prefer to perform filtering in discrete time, as these are run in computers and our sensors only give us new observations at fixed update rates, so discrete time instances. We therefore need to translate our continuous time models, which are typically described using differential equations, into something time discrete. So the first aspect that we are going to focus on is how we can take our continuous time motion models and translate them into discrete time models. Whereas the first aspect focuses on the deterministic or physical part of the motion, the second aspect that we are going to discuss relates to the motion noise. So if we have a reasonable description of the noise in the time domain, how can we relate this to the noise covariance in the discrete time model? Now, here are two self-assessment questions for you to think about. 